What up, y'all? Cyrus, uh, the founder of Paleo Foraging. I teach uh, wild edibles, Paleolithic technology, and herbalism, backed by science and history. Specifically, I study historical life ways of indigenous peoples in North America to inform uh, practical foraging and uh, primitive skills in herbalism. So I'm uh, from Austin. I'm in the heart of Austin right now. Uh, Barton Springs, I was teaching some classes for Barton Springs University. So I'm gonna cover some very good wild edibles in the area, some most prominent ones. Things are mostly in season or uh, are ripening in the summer or fall of the species I have here, but a lot of them are preserved and aren't necessarily available now. So the first one, and the most relevant for Barton Springs would be your pecan. And then there's actually a tree of this right above us and there's pecan trees all around. Pecans really like wet areas. They typically grow by creeks or stream sides or rivers. And they're in the hickory genus, and this whole thing's a fruit. And if you crack it open, they have this beautiful pecan inside. And pecans are really useful as far as a wild plant food. Maybe one of the most because of their high concentration of fats. So a lot of wild plants, the wild edibles, don't have a lot of fats, but pecans have a huge amount. And for that reason, Pecans and other things in the hickory genus, which is Caria, this is Caria illinoinensis, uh, they were highly valued by natives in the, the southeast and just the eastern part of the country where they commonly occur because of their uh, amount of fats they have in the protein. But one way the Haudenosaunee would use them, hickories in general, is to grind them up and then boil it and then the oil rises to the top and you skim that off and you can use that to anoint the hair or the body. You can uh, infuse some aromatics such as conifer leaves in with that in order to create a mosquito deterrent. But uh, a Comanche name for the pecan was nakutavi, which means to crack with the teeth. And that's because uh, pecans unlike other hickories, have a pretty thin shell and can be easily cracked with the teeth, although your dentist probably will tell you otherwise. But you can dry these to preserve them or just keep them whole in the shell and they store a very long time. The holes also have some interesting properties. These and other hickory species are uh, historically used for dyes. So whenever you're shelling or you're hulling your hickories, they'll have some nice juices which will oxidize pretty quickly upon exposure to air. I don't know if it'll happen quick enough for us here, but it'll turn your fingers black, and for that reason, they were used for a dye. But it's mainly these whole juices. And the pecans also had a number of medicinal uses as well. The Mexican kickapoo would grind up the leaves and apply that to skins to uh, kill off ringworms. The pecan also has furnished some excellent wood, but I'm gonna try to keep the coverage of the species to the, the most basic things. So other things that are very uh, rich in proteins and fats is the very well-known acorns. So there's a number of different species in Austin and Central Texas. The most common ones by far are going to be Texas live oak or escarpment live oak, that's Quercus fusiformis, essentially identical to Quercus virginiana, and the these are the acorns of those. They're relatively small. This is actually on the larger size among that species. Like you can see my stained fingers from that pecan. And so those you can use to eat, and I'll cover how to in a second, but the other common one would be the red oak, Quercus bucklei. So pretty easy to distinguish with the serrated, sharp lobed leaves. And the acorns of those are uh, significantly larger. Here's a better one. And uh, this is the chinkapin oak, Quercus muhlenbergii. This is commonly planted by the city. I actually gathered this from inside Barton Springs area. And then you also have the burr oak, which is exceptionally large and also commonly planted by the city. But that's a pretty efficient use of time to, to harvest this because you just have to crack it open and then you have this huge amount of nut meat inside. So all acorns from all oaks are edible, but they are not edible raw. Virtually none of them are edible raw. You need to leach out the tannins. So the common method for leaching out tannins is first you have to hole the pecan or just crack the shell. And then you have mostly this nut meat in there. And then on top of that, you have a little bit of a papery shell or a papery covering. And you can kind of scrape that off and winnow it off. And then this is the real nut meat inside. 
but the way to get to be edible is to grind it up first. You want to grind it up as fine as possible and you can do that with a, a mortar and pestle, commonly a stone mortar or stone pestle is used and you can use a hopper basket or a basket like this with a hollowed out bottom to catch all the debris. You grind it up and you get the finer and finer particles. I won't go into the details of how that's exactly done, but once you've grinded it down to fine particles, you want to leach it. So leaching is a process of removing the tannins by adding water and allowing those to percolate out. So I might fill up a basket with this with acorn meal and then add water slowly and allow it to slowly percolate out. And then I'll repeat that process several times and sampling the meal along the way until I don't detect any more of those bitter tannins. Uh, another possible method is to combine it with clays, certain clays such as red clay will also bind the tannins and that, that was used by, by some natives in the, the final process of cooking it into a bread. But once you've leached all out the tannins, you, it's ready to eat and you can make it into a mush or uh, add it to soups or stews or wrap it in the leaves, cook it in an earth oven, make it bread. And natives would typically store about two years of supply of the acorns, so it means is 500 pounds and the acorns were by far the most important wild food resource uh, generally among indigenous North Americans. And that's because oaks can be found all over and are very uh, full of carbohydrates and fats. But if you live in the Southwest, you're going to have less access to acorns. Now, Southwest natives did eat acorns where they could be had, but in the Southwest, typically the most important wild food plant would be taken over by mesquite. Now, Here's the foliage of the mesquite. This is a little bit dried up, but it has these huge thorns and these compound leaves. And this, this is actually a pretty poor example of mesquite. It was the worst mesquite season I've ever seen. These, are, these little black spots are signs of feeding damage from sap-sucking insects. But you can just pull them off the tree and, and chew them up and then spit out the fibers and the beans. But for a more intensive processing method, there was two main methods that were used. In both of them, typically the beans were not the part that were eaten. It was actually the pod itself or the outer part, the sort of a fleshy mesocarp in between the bean and the thin layer of skin. So what was done is you take a pile of them, you throw it in a large mortar and pestle. I made this out of black willow and uh, native mortar and pestles historically could get even larger than this. Sometimes simply a hole is dug in the earth and lined with uh, rawhide and then you spend some time pounding it up and it, it can take a while so be patient. And, but at the first stages when it hasn't fully dried it's still kind of sticky and at that stage it's very difficult to grind up completely into a dry meal. But the most common method to use that would be add water, strain, and drink. So it, for example, in every Cahuilla household, there was a clay oil or a big pot that was full of crushed mesquite beans and water. And just periodically, you would dip out some of that cold infusion and drink it. And it tastes kind of like in between caramel and tamarind. So a very nice taste. And to preserve it long term, you grind it up and you sift out the seeds. So you use different gradations of baskets, such as a very uh, large weave or going down to finer and finer weaves till you separate out the beans and the larger fibers and once you have that fine meal you can add that to any sort of dishes eat it plain fresh or with some soups or stews or you could sprinkle some water on it form it into a cake dry those cakes those cakes would store for years and are common trade items used among natives the last sort of nuts or bean i have here is palo verde this is Parkinsonia culiata. By the way, the mesquite is Neltuma glandulosa. This is Parkinsonia culiata. This is a common element of the southwest flora as well, uh, but it has very, uh, Palo Verde is the name for it, which comes from the green branches and trunks, which is sort of uh, typical of that. And it has these sort of linear leaves. This one's dry and brown, but they also have tiny little leaflets that come off though. They just, they typically will fall off or depending on the amount of water it has. Anyway, the Palo Verde, at this stage, you eat the, at all stages you eat the beans, but at this stage when they're mature, you would need to grind up these beans. And they can actually be very hard at this stage, you need to grind it up and cook them. But when they are green and young and tender and fresh, you can pluck them off the tree and eat them whole and raw without any need for processing. Although if you do want to boil them and add a little bit of salt, it makes it uh, even more easy to eat because the pods get even softer and you can do it just like edamame where you bite onto the pod and pull off the bean into your mouth and eat it as is. 
Another very important food, moving on to the fruits, is the prickly pear. In the Southwest, this was probably the most uh, important uh, fleshy fruit among Southwest natives. And uh, this is Apuntia ingomaniae, or cactus apple, the most common species in the area, but all prickly pears in the genus Apuntia produce edible fruits. Now these I've simply sliced in half and dried, and that was the most common method of preservation among the natives in the Southwest historically, and just natives throughout the, the North America, because uh, a lot of people don't know, but prickly pears go all the way up into Canada. Now to remove the spines of the prickly pear, a lot of people nowadays want to burn it or uh, skin it, but the historically most common method of removing spines was simply to brush them off. Now a grass brush could be used, made specific for that purpose, or you can simply uh, just grab whatever is on hand, maybe a, a bunch of juniper needles and use this to brush them off, or even just roll them around on the sand or the ground to remove the spines. And I find that to be a pretty thorough method of removing those fine hair-like glochids, which are uh, very unpleasant to get in your hands, very small spines. Another extremely important food resource common among uh, natives throughout North America would be wild grapes. This is a genus Vetus, same genus as commercial grapes, but there are many different species in the US. This one is Vetus mustangensis, or mustang grape, which is uh, characterized by these very pubescent, almost white leaf undersides. And you can actually eat the leaves as well. The leaves have a nice tart taste, and the grapes are very delicious. And uh, these are also dried, and that was the common method of preservation historically. But they're going to be a little bit more tart than your grocery store grape, but a lot more nutritious as well. And you can gather huge amounts of it in very little time. I can gather a five gallon bucket of Mustang grapes in maybe half an hour, and I could gather as many as I wanted through each year. So I usually gather enough to last a whole year once they're ripe and in season. Another excellent one that's actually specific to the hill country is the agarita. So agarita is Berberus trifoliolata. Trifoliolata comes from these trifoliate leaves. They're very spiny. This one's actually pretty good for beginners because not a lot of things look like this. Uh, you might mistake it with Elix opaca or American holly, which is an ornamental that also has red berries, but the leaves of that are much larger and you can find leaves that aren't trifoliate like that. And the fruits of these are very delicious. You can gather a ton. I have some videos showing the exact gathering method that I use in order to gather as much as possible. But uh, these are dried, and I have some pieces of root here, and these make an excellent dye. And they're historically used as dye by natives. Actually, the U.S. military would dye parachutes with this in World War II. But the, all of the wood is a very vibrant yellow color, and... Uh, that's one that I always have on hand. Another one found in the same habitat, but is very much less widely known, is stretchberry, or elbow bush, Forestiera pubescens. It's kind of unremarkable foliage, but is characterized by opposite, or actually it's not opposite, it looks opposite often, but the leaves, will, the branches will come off at right angles often but uh, as a sort of pubescent leaf structure as well. But this is an olive family, so they have an interesting taste to them. They're nice and sweet, uh, kind of like raisins, but they have also some additional complexity to their flavors. My absolute favorite of the area, and of all time, my favorite fruit in the world is this one. The only thing similar to this is one that's found in Mexico, and that's uh, Sopote Negro, or Diospirus nigra. And uh, a common name in English for that plant is the chocolate pudding fruit. So that gives you some idea as to the taste of this, which is somewhat like chocolate pudding or perhaps prune or plum. It's got a very rich and complex flavor and it's also extremely sweet and is definitely a favorite among wildlife. The way I know this is ripe is I start seeing very black coyote poop and because uh, coyotes love it and all, many animals do. And the way I know season is over is there's no more black coyote poop, although they'll, they're perfectly happy to eat some pretty old ones that I don't like. But this is Dyrospirus texana, or Texas persimmon. This is also only found in the hill country or central Texas, but it is a, a very unique tree. And its leaves are somewhat unremarkable and may at first glance appear to be kind of just like an, any other oak or something. But a good way to distinguish it in the field is its smooth gray bark of its trunk. So its trunk bark peels off, revealing very light gray and smooth trunk. And I preserve those just by drying. Another recipe I have is to boil them, strain out the seeds, and then throw it in a blender with some coconut cream. And it makes like an amazing pudding or uh, 
ice cream. One of my favorites also in the area is sumac. So there's three different species of sumac which are, are commonly found in Central Texas. This one is Rus lanceolata or flame leaf sumac. This is kind of limited to Central and East Texas blackland prairies ecosystems like it's very open sunny areas. But all sumac fruits, which is in the genus Rus, that is true sumacs, produce these reddish edible fruits that are covered with malic acid. Malic acid is an ingredient that's uh, in like sour candies. So it's got a very tart taste. You can kind of see they're kind of sticky or, or shiny and that's that sort of sweet malic acid on the outside. When you touch one to your tongue it's very tart and quite good. And a common method you, used by natives historically to consume sumac was simply to mash it up with some water, strain it, and you have a nice tart drink, it's sumac aid or like lemonade. Here's one that's probably in your backyard and found all over uh, North America, this genus at least. This species is Celtis levigata or sugarberry, and uh, these have uh, pretty good fruits. These have a thin layer of sweet flesh on the outside, and on the inside you have this pretty hard seed. The Dakota name for the hackberry is yamnumugapi, which means crunchier to crunch and you can crunch them up with your teeth but they're kind of a uh, you feel like you're about to break your teeth but if you grind them up in a mortar and pestle that inner seed is also very nutritious you can make a lot of meal with that you can grind them up and form little put them on the end of sticks and roast those over the fire maybe mix it with some honey or some grease that was a historical method of the Comanche oh I forgot to mention the black walnut when I was covering the nuts and uh, fatty stuff now this is uh, Juglans nigra a black walnut but its flesh is not as uh, fleshy as the, the commercial walnuts. So you can, it's harder to crack open, much harder than the pecan or um, the commercial walnut. But it does have a lot of nutrition in it. And one method to get around that hard shell historically was to... Uh, this one cracked open. You can see the nut meat in there and you can actually see it's sort of shiny from all the oils in it. But the Haudenosaunee would crush up just the whole walnut and then mix that with water. Actually, I actually think it was Apache that did this. Mix with water and then filter that and then you have walnut milk. Or you can boil it and the oil will form on top and you can skim that up and use uh, walnut oil. And the last fruits I have here would be the elderberry. This is Sambucus canadensis. You've probably heard of elderberry. It's a common ingredient in a lot of medicines. It's pretty small. It's not very common in Central Texas. It has a pretty patchy distribution. and uh, But it is found commonly in certain areas along creek bottoms, but not in the water, just nearby. I can't show you the leaves of this place. But another interesting thing about the elderberry is its hollow pith to its stems. So the inside of it is the pith. Well, I'll show you a better example here. It's very spongy and soft. And so that's easily removed, allowing you to use it for things requiring a tube, such as a pipe. Here's your, uh, very historical double barrel pipe. I'm just kidding, it's not historical at all. It's just a random creation I made. And then your elderberry flute. You have your Turk's cap, which is kind of wilty. The whole plant of Turk's cap is edible. It's in the Malvaceae, the Malu family, and a lot of things in that family are edible. But the best part of it is this delicious fruit. Another the name for it is wax mallow. It's Malvaviscus arboreus. There's an example of the plant right there. It's very commonly planted along the city and those red flowers are also edible and you can make a nice tea out of it. It's kind of like a hibiscus tea. And the leaves of it are good, but I kind of only like to eat the young ones when they're raw and fresh because it's when they get larger, a little bit tougher and you want to probably cook them at that stage. Another favorite of mine is Chiltepin or Capsicum annuum variety Glabriusculum. Now this is the same species as jalapeno, cayenne, bell pepper, just anything called pepper, paprika. Those are all capsicum annuum. And that species was domesticated in Mexico around 6,000 years ago. And the wild variety of that species probably look very similar to this species because it has very small fruits. Now the Nahuatl name for this would be chiltepin, which means flea pepper because of its size and its spherical shape. Another name for it is chili pecan. Some people sometimes distinguish the difference between chiltepin and pecan as pecan being more elongate and chiltepin being rounded, but they're the same variety of the same species, but they are also cultivated and sold in stores as chili pecan.